Hey everyone, thank you for listening to Black Clock Audio Tales. This is week one of Jules Verne, and we've got Castle of the Carpathians. Uh, you know, it may have inspired the topography for Bram Stoker's Dracula. I mean, it very likely could have, and you know, not a lot of stuff happened in Transylvania and literature, and you know, I'm pretty sure Bram Stoker probably read this. But hey, uh, how about the fact that we're doing Jules Verne all month long? And after that, we're going to be doing the uh, Underground City, Mysterious Island, uh, that one about the moon and the one about the Antarctic of Jules Verne this month. We're probably going to have some experts on the show talking about Jules Verne and talking about Jules Verne's influence on literature and fiction and science fiction for sure. And yeah, yeah, it's going to be a cool, fun time. And you know what you should do? If you like the show, you should let us know by going to Facebook.com, look for Black Clock Audio Tales or People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos if That's the one you like better. And let us know that you like the show. Review us, rate us, whatever. Let people know that we're out there. Share us. Tell people about it. Be like, you know what? The announcer guy kind of sucks, but if you skip ahead, probably about like, I don't know, I'm guessing about three minutes, you'll get to the story. You can start listening to it. And sometimes he pipes in for commercials. But hey, you know what? It's free. So you know what? Let people know it's free and that I'm not going to put up a paywall. And that... People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos, Black Clock Audio Tales, is a weekly podcast, but we put out enough every week that you've got stuff all week long. I ran out of stuff all week long, and then I remembered, oh shoot, I've got that post stuff that I edited last week that's coming up today, and then I was like, awesome. And then I remembered I also had some unspooled to listen to, but I'll talk about that. No, no I won't. I don't talk about other podcasts on my podcast. Anyway, so thank you for listening to this podcast. And also, I do talk about other podcasts. You can check out um, Dave's Corner of the Universe bits and segments that we do here. Hopefully sooner than later, we'll have Dave's Underground Goat Shenanigans. And we've got Black Clock Audio Tales, which you're listening to right now. We do special segments from time to time with folks like Ken Hyde or Andrew Migliori or Andrew Grace or... um, Let's see, sometimes we get David Heath to talk about stuff, and sometimes we're lucky enough to get uh, Scott Glancy. We've had Rossi Lockhart from Word Horde, and we've even had Rodney Anonymous from the Dead Milkman on the show. So check us out, pgttcm.com, for all the back episodes. Here we go. The catastrophe was imminent. Franz could only prevent it by rendering the Baron incapable of executing his plan. It was then 11 o'clock at night. With no further fear of being discovered, Franz resumed his work. The bricks were easily taken out of the wall, but its thickness was such that half an hour elapsed before the opening was large enough to admit him through. As soon as he set foot in this chapel, open to all the winds that blew, he felt himself refreshed by the night air. Through the gaps in the roof and the window frames, the sky could be seen, with the light clouds driving before the breeze. Here and there were a few stars, which were growing pale in the light of the moon now rising on the horizon. Franz's object was to find the door which opened at the end of the chapel, by which the Baron de Gortz and Orphanic had gone out, and, crossing the nave obliquely, he advanced towards the apse. This was in the darkness where none of the moonlight penetrated, and his foot stumbled against the ruins of the tombs and the fragments fallen from the roof. At last, at the very end of the apse, behind the re in the dark corner, Franz felt a moldy door yield before his hand. This door opened on a gallery which apparently traversed the outer wall. By it, the Baron and Orphanic had entered the chapel, and by it they had just departed. As soon as Franz was in the galley, he again found himself in complete darkness. After winding about a good deal without either a rise or a fall, he was certain that he was now on a level with the interior courts. Half an hour later, the darkness did not seem to be so deep. A kind of half-light glided through several lateral openings in the gallery. Franz was able to walk faster and reach the large casemate contrived under the platform of the bastion which flanked the left angle of the outer wall. The casemate was pierced with narrow loopholes, through which streamed the rays of the moon. In the opposite wall was an open door. Franz's first care was to place himself in one of the loopholes so as to breathe the fresh night breeze for a few seconds. But just as he was moving away, he thought he saw two or three shadowy shapes moving at the lower end of the Orgal Plateau which was now full in the moonlight up to the somber masses of the pine forest. Franz looked again. 
A few men were moving about on the plateau just in front of the trees. Doubtless the Carlsberg police brought by Rotsko. Had they then decided to attack that night in hope of surprising the occupants of the castle? Or were they waiting for daybreak? It required considerable effort on Franz's part not to shout out and call Rotsko, who would have heard and recognized his voice. But the shout might reach the dungeon, and before the police had scaled the wall, Rodolfo de Gortz would have time to put his device in action and escape by way of the tunnel. Franz succeeded in restraining himself and moved away from the loophole. Crossing the casemate, he went out to the other door and continued along the gallery. Five hundred yards further on, he arrived at the foot of the staircase, which rose in the thickness of the walls. Had he then at last arrived at the dungeon, in the center of the place of arms? It seemed so. But this staircase might not be the principal one giving access to the different floors. It was composed of a series of circular steps arranged like the thread of a screw within a dark, narrow cage. Franz went up quietly, listening but hearing nothing, and after twenty steps, reaching a landing. There a door opened onto the terrace which surrounded the dungeon at the height of the first floor. Franz glided along this terrace and, taking care to keep in shelter behind the parapet, looked out over the Argyle Plateau. Several men were still on the edge of the firwood, and there was no sign of their coming nearer the castle. Resolved to meet the Baron before he fled through the tunnel, Franz went around the terrace and reached another door where the staircase resumed its upward course. He put his foot on the first step, rested both his hands against the wall, and began to ascend. All was silent. The room on the first floor was not inhabited. Franz hurried on up to the landings which gave access to the higher floors. When he reached the third landing, his foot found no further steps. There the staircase ended at the highest floor of the dungeon, that which was crowned by the crenellated parapet from which formerly floated the standard of barons of courts. In the wall to the left of the landing, there was a door which was shut. Through the keyhole filtered a ray of light. Franz listened and heard no sound inside the apartment. Looking through the keyhole, he could see only the left side of the room, which was in the bright light, the rest being in darkness. Franz gently opened the door. A spacious apartment occupied the whole of this upper floor. On its circular walls rested a paneled roof, the ribs of which met in a heavy boss in the center. Thick tapestry with figure subjects covered the walls. Some old furniture, cupboards, sideboards, armchairs, and stools were scattered in artistic disorder. At the window hung thick curtains which prevented any of the light within from shining without. On the floor was a thick woolen carpet on which no footstep made a sound. The arrangement of the room was at least peculiar, and as he entered it, Franz was struck by the contrast between its light and dark portions. To the right of the door, its end was invisible in the deep gloom. To the left, on the contrary, was a sort of platform, the black draping of which received a powerful light due to some apparatus of concentration so placed in front of it as to be unseen. About twelve feet from this platform, from which it was separated by a screen about breast high, was an ancient, long-backed armchair, which the screen kept in a half-light. Near the chair was a little table with a cloth on it, and on this was a rectangular box. The box was about twelve or fifteen inches long and five or six wide, and the cover, encrusted with jewels, was raised, showing that it contained a metallic cylinder. As he entered the room, Franz saw that the armchair was occupied. Its occupant did not move, but sat with his head leant against the back of the chair, his eyes closed, his right arm extended on the table, his hand resting against the box. It was Rodolphe de Gortz. Was it to abandon himself to sleep for a few hours that the Baron desired to pass this last night on the upper floor of the dungeon? No, that could not be after what Franz had heard him say to Orphanic. The Baron de Gortz was alone in this room, and, comfortably to the orders he had received, there could be no doubt that Orphanic had already escaped along the tunnel. And Lestilla? Had not Rodolphe de Gortz said that he would hear her for a last time in this castle of the Carpathians before it was destroyed by the explosion? And for what other reason would he have come back to this room where doubtless she came each evening to fascinate him with her song? Where, then, was Lestilla? Franz saw her not, heard her not. After all, what did it matter now that Rodolphe de Gortz was at his mercy? Franz restrained himself from speaking, but in his present state of excitement, would he not throw himself on this man he hated as he was hated? This man who had carried off Lestilla, Lestilla living in mad, mad for him, would he not kill him? Franz stole up stealthily to the armchair. He had but to make a step to seize the Baron, and he had already raised his hand. Suddenly, Lestilla appeared. Franz let his knife fall on the carpet. Lestilla was standing on the platform in the full blaze of the light, her hair undone, her arms stretched out, supremely lovely in the white costume of Angelica in Orlando, just as she had appeared on the bastion of the castle. Her eyes, fixed on the young Count, gazed to the very depths of his soul. 
It was impossible that Franz could not be seen by her, and yet she made no gesture to call him to her. She opened not her lips to speak to him. Alas, she was mad. Franz was about to rush onto the stage and seize her in his arms to carry her off. Lestilla had begun to sing. Without stirring from his chair, Baron de Gortz had leant forward to listen. In the paroxysm of ecstasy, the dilettante breathed her voice as if it were a perfume. Such as he had been at the performances in the theaters of Italy, so was he now in this room, in infinite solitude, at the summit of this dungeon which towered over Transylvania. Yes, Lestilla sang. She sang for him. Only for him. It was as though a breath exhaled from her lips which seemed to remain without a movement. If reason had left her, at least her artist soul remained in its plentitude. Franz also stood intoxicated with the charms of this voice he had not heard for five long years. He was absorbed in the ardent contemplation of this woman he had thought he should never see again, and who was there, alive as if some miracle had resuscitated her before his eyes. In the song she sang, was it not one of those which would ever make his heartstrings vibrate? Yes, it was the finale of the tragic scene in Orlando, the finale in which the singer's heart breaks in the final phrases, Innamorata mia cuore triamante, voglio morire. This ineffable phrase Franz followed note by note, and he said to himself that it would not be interrupted as it had been in the San Carlo Theater. No, it would not die between La Stella's lips as it had done in her farewell. Franz hardly breathed. His whole life was bound up in music. A few measures more and it would end in all its incomparable purity. But the voice began to fail. It seemed as though Lestilla hesitated as she repeated the words of poignant grief. Voglio morire. Would she fall on this stage as she had done on the other? She did not fall, but a song fell silent on the very same note as it had done in San Carlo. She uttered a cry, and it was the same cry Franz had heard on that night. And yet Lestilla still stood there with her adored look. The look that awoke all the deepest feelings of the young man's heart. Franz leapt towards her. He would carry her away from this room, away from this castle. And he found himself face to face with the Baron, who had just risen. Franz de Telec exclaimed Rodolphe de Gortz. Franz de Telec escaped. But Franz did not answer, and running toward the stage, he cried, Stilla, my dear Stilla, here I find you, alive. Alive, La Stilla alive, exclaimed Baron de Gortz. And the ironical phrase ended in a shout of laughter and which was apparent all the fury of revenge. Alive, continued Rodolphe de Gortz. Well then, Franz de Telec, try and take her away from me. Franz stretched out his arms to her, whose eyes were ardently fixed on his. At the same instant, Rodolphe stooped, picked up the knife that Franz had let fall, and rushed at the motionless figure. Franz threw himself on him to turn away the blow with which she was threatened. He was too late, and the knife struck her to the heart. And as the blow was given, there was a crash of breaking glass, and with the fragments which flew into all parts of the room, Lestilla vanished. Franz remained as if lifeless. He could not understand. Had he also gone mad? And then Rodolphe de Gortz cried. Lestilla again escapes, Franz de Telec, but her voice, her voice remains to me. Her voice is mine, mine alone, and will never belong to another. Franz would have thrown himself on the Baron, but his strength failed him, and he fell unconscious at the foot of the stage. Rodolphe de Gortz did not even notice the young Count. He took the box from the table... He rushed from the room down to the first terrace of the dungeon and was running round it to gain the other door when there was the report of a gun. It was Rotsko who, from the slope of the counterscarp, had just shot at the Baron de Gortz. The Baron was unhurt, but the bullet shattered the box he held in his arms. He uttered a terrible cry. Her voice! Her voice! He repeated. Her soul! Lestilla's soul! It is ruined! 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 And then with his hair bristling and his hands clenched, he had seen to run along the terrace shouting, Her voice! Her voice! They have taken away from me her voice. Curse them. And he disappeared through the door at the moment Rotsko and Nick Deck were, without waiting for the police, striving to scale the wall. Almost immediately, a tremendous explosion shook the whole extent of Plaza. Sheaves of flames sprang to the clouds, and an avalanche of stones fell on the Vulcan Road. Bastions, curtain, dungeon, chapel were nothing but a pile of ruins scattered over the Orgal Plateau. End of chapter 16. It would not have been forgotten that according to the conversation between the Baron and Orphanic, the explosion should only have destroyed the castle after the departure of Rudolf de Gortz. But at the time the explosion took place, it was impossible for the Baron to have had time to escape through the tunnel. In the transport of grief, in the folly of despair, unconscious of what he did, had then Rudolf de Gortz brought on an immediate catastrophe on which he could be but the first victim? After the incomprehensible words which had escaped him when Rothko's bullet had broken the box he carried, had he intended to bury himself beneath the ruins of the castle? 
In any case, it was very fortunate that the police, surprised by Roscoe's shot, were at a considerable distance when the explosion shook the ground. Only a few of them were struck by the fragments which fell over the plateau. Roscoe and the Forester were alone at the base of the curtain, and it was indeed a miracle that they were not killed by the shower of stones. The explosion had done its work when Roscoe, Nick Deck, and the police entered the enclosure over the ditch, which had then nearly filled up by the fall of the walls. Fifty yards within the wall, at the base of the dungeon, a body was found among the ruins. It was that of Rodolphe de Gortz. A few old people of the district, among others Master Colts, recognized him perfectly. Rotsko and Nick Deck sought only to discover the young Count. As Franz had not appeared in the time arranged with his man, it followed that he had been unable to escape from the castle. But could Rotsko hope that he had survived, and that he was not one of the victims of the catastrophe? And so he cried, and Nick Deck did not know what to do to soothe him. However, in about half an hour the young Count was found on the first floor of the dungeon, beneath one of the buttresses which had saved him from being crushed. My master, my poor master. Count. Such were the first words uttered by Rotsko and Nick Deck as they bent over Franz. They believed him dead. He had only fainted. Franz opened his eyes, but his wandering look did not seem to recognize Rotsko, nor did he hear him. Nick Deck, who had raised the young Count in his arms, spoke to him again, but he made no reply. The last words of Lestilla's song escaped from his lips. Enamorata Vogue Mori. Franz de Telec was mad. End of chapter 17 As the young Count had gone mad, no one would probably have ever heard an explanation of the events of which the castle of the Carpathians had been the theater, if it had not been for the revelations which came about in this manner. For four days Orphanic had waited, as agreed, for the Baron to meet him at the town of Bistritz. But as he did not appear, he began to wonder if he had perished in the explosion. Urged as much by curiosity as anxiety, he had left the town, gone back towards Worst, and was prowling about the ruins of the castle when he was arrested by the police, who knew him from the description given by Rotsko. Once in the chief town of the district, in the presence of the magistrates before whom he had been taken, Orphanic made no difficulty about replying to the questions put to him in the course of the inquiry, ordered in the circumstances of the catastrophe. But it must be confessed that the sad end of the Baron de Gortz seemed in no way to affect this learned egotist and maniac whose heart was entirely in his inventions. In the first place, on the urgent demand of Rotsko, Orphanic stated that Lestilla was dead, really dead, and, such was his expression, buried and well buried, for more than five years in the cemetery of Santa Nuevo Campo at Naples. This statement was not the least astonishing of those provoked by this curious adventure. If Lestilla were dead, how came it that Franz could hear her voice in the saloon of the inn, see her on the bastion, and listen to her song when he was in the crypt? And how could he have found her alive in the dungeon? The explanation of this apparently inexplicable phenomenon was as follows. It will be remembered how deep was the Baron's despair when the rumor spread that Lestilla had resolved to retire from the stage and become Countess of Telec. The artiste's admirable talent and all his dilettante gratifications would thus escape him. Then it was that Orphanic suggested that by means of a phonograph, he should collect the principal airs from the opera she would appear in during her farewell performances at San Carlo. This instrument had reached a high state of perfection at this period, and Orphanic had so improved it that the human voice underwent no change and lost none of its charm or purity. The Baron accepted Orphanic's offer. Phonographs were successfully and secretly introduced into the private box of the theater during the last weeks of the season, and in this way their cylinders received the cavatinas and romances from the operas and concerts, including the melody from San Stefano and the final air from Orlando, which was interrupted by Lestilla's death. These were the circumstances under which the Baron had shut himself up in the castle of the Carpathians, and there, each night, he listened to the music given out by the phonograph. And not only did he hear Lestilla as if he were in the box, but, and that would appear absolutely incomprehensible, he saw her as if she were alive before his eyes. It was a simple optical illusion. It will be remembered the Baron de Gortz had obtained a magnificent portrait of the singer. This portrait represented her in the white costume of Angelica in Orlando. Her magnificent hair in disorder, her arms extended. By means of glasses inclined at a certain angle calculated by Orphanic, when a light was thrown on the portrait placed in front of a glass, Lestilla appeared by reflection as real as if she were still alive, and in all the splendor of her beauty. It was by means of this apparatus, taken for the night to the bastion platform that Rodolphe de Gortz had made her appear when he wished to lure Franz de Telec into the castle, and by its means the young Count had seen her in the room of the dungeon while her fanatic admirer was in full enjoyment of the voice reproduced by the phonograph. Such very briefly were the explanations given in much detail by Orphanic during his examination, 
and it was with infinite pride that he declared himself the author of these ingenious inventions, which he had brought to the highest pitch of perfection. But if Orphanic had explained these phenomenon, he did not explain why it was that the Baron de Gortz had not had time to escape by the tunnel on the Vulcan Road. When, however, he had heard that the bullet had shattered the object Rodolphe de Gortz bore in his hands, he understood how it had happened. The box was the phonographic apparatus containing Lestilla's last song, that which the Baron had wished to hear for the last time in the dungeon before destroying it. With its destruction, his life was destroyed, and, mad with despair, he had resolved to bury himself under the ruins of the castle. Baron Rodolphe was buried in the graveyard at worst with the honors due to the ancient family that ended with him. The young Count Franz de Telec was taken by Rotzko to the castle of Krajoa, and there he devoted himself entirely to watching over his master. Orphanic had willingly handed over the phonographs containing the other songs of Lestilla, and when Franz heard the voice of the great artiste, he seemed to listen to them and recover a little of his old intelligence, and it seemed as though his mind were struggling to revive in the memories of the unforgettable past. In fact, a few months later he recovered his reason, and through him became known what had passed during the last night in the castle of the Carpathians. The marriage of charming Miriota and Nick Deck took place during the week following the catastrophe. After receiving the benediction from the Pope of the village of Vulcan, they returned to Worst, where Master Colts had reserved for them the best room in his house. But although these different phenomena have been explained in so natural a manner, it must not be imagined that Miriota ceased to believe in their supernatural nature. Nick found reasoning in vain. So did Jonas, who had as many customers as ever in the King Matthias. She would not be convinced. Neither would Master Colts, nor the Shepherd Frick, nor Magister Hermid, nor the other inhabitants of Worst, and many years will elapse before they will renounce their superstitious beliefs. Dr. Patak, who had resumed his customary swagger, is often heard to say, Well, did I not tell them so? Spirits in the castle, just as if there ever were any spirits. But no one listens to him, and he is invariably asked to be silent when his facetiousness exceeds due bounds. The Magister Hermit continues to base the lessons he gives to the young folk of Worst in the study of the Transylvanian legends, and for many years yet, the villagers will believe that spirits from the other world haunt the ruins of the castle of the Carpathians. The End End of Chapter 18 End of the Castle of the Carpathians by Jules Verne